Okay. Good morning. Uh, good morning, dear doctors, and welcome, uh, welcome to our fetal symposium. It's nice to have you all here in the morning. Uh, I hope that uh, you enjoy the day, and I hope we can share some uh, useful knowledge together with each other. Uh, I will be speaking today, uh, today about some guides, uh, guidelines in perinatal screening for congenital heart disease. First, why do we have to screen for congenital heart disease? Why is prenatal identification of fetal uh, congenital heart disease important? Uh, we believe that screening is important because, uh, why do you think it's important? Why do, why do you think we do fetal echoes? Okay, yeah. Okay, okay, so, so it's important because Congenital heart disease, in general, makes a big burden to the, to the parents, to the community, to the society. Congenital heart disease is the most common birth defects. They account for 1% of the live births. Uh, live births. It's estimated that in the state, every 15 minutes, a baby is born with congenital heart disease. And it accounts for 4% of the neonatal deaths. And surprisingly, it's 30 to 50% of deaths related to congenital anomalies in general. Also, it's very related to the neurodevelopmental progress of the baby because there might be associated some congenital anomalies, especially associated syndromes. There might be problems related to the postnatal cardiac functions, the effect of the cyanosis, the effect of the hypoxia on the developing brain. All this will lead to some outcome on the baby development. Also, if the baby is going to surgery, so uh, like long-lasting hospital admissions, uh, long stay in the hospital, loss of contact with the family for some time, and lo uh, loss of chance to acquire the milestones. All this would lead to developmental problems. So what are the benefits we, we get from screening for congenital heart disease? The first thing, as Dr. Suleiman mentioned here, that there is the problem the parental counseling and preparation. So patients will have a chance before the baby is, is even born to understand what is the problem we are speaking about. What does it mean that my baby will have some, some, and what does it mean? What is the prognosis for this condition? This condition, is it a common condition? Is it a rare condition? What is supposed the baby will, what the life the baby can suppose to have? All this will help the family to, to learn about the treatment options for their child, whether they decide that they will go for treatment or they will decide that they will choose not to treat or palliative or anything. And also, they will make decisions concerning the management approach that, that is best for their family, and we will start to plan for the specific needs at birth as we will come to, to say. Second thing is that it has been proved that it improves the neonatal survival. In a, multi, in a meta analysis study of eight, observ uh, eight observation study, it was shown that prenatal diagnosis reduced the mortality prior to planned cardiac surgery compared with postnatal diagnosis. There was a significant difference in the number. As we can see, uh, one death in, 200, in nearly 200 prenatal diagnoses compared to 30 of 800. It will improve the neonatal survival as we said, and it will give us a chance to manage if the baby has any problem to, that can be treated. The most common thing that we treat is the fetal tachycardia. Again, we can, uh, another set of treatment that is the invasive intra, invasive in, uh, in utero cardiac interventions like valvuloplasty, like uh, septostomy, like we can, if the baby is having severe problems in his valve, severe aortic stenosis or If the baby is having severe aortic stenosis or severe pulmonary stenosis, this can be managed, managed prenatally. Or if the baby is having hypoplastic left heart disease with restrictive uh, P of O, this can be managed with atrial septostomy. Again, we will have the chance. Again, we will have the chance to to treat to improve the outcome in the neonatal care. So by knowing that my patient might be having a duct dependent lesion, I might plan to start prostaglandin early, so this can save the baby from early cyanosis and hypoxia. If I know that my baby has severe valve lesion, I will be prepared by, uh, to, to take him to the cath lab to plan for valvuloplasty. If I know that my baby has complete heart block and this might affect him, I will be ready for pacemaker planning. 
Okay. Do we harm, uh, have any harms for prenatal diagnosis? What do you suggest? Do you think there's any, uh, we should not do it because it has any harms? <laughs> okay, of course we should do it, but we will. We must know that this will have only one problem. It will cause, instead of having this happy mom shopping for her baby supply, we will have this sad mom Googling her baby symptoms. But of course, to be sad and prepared is better than to have an unexpected surprise on the delivery room. Okay. So let's go now to the indications for fetal echocardiography. Uh, we have the, 213, uh, the 2013 guidelines and we have the 2019 guidelines and I will focus on the 2019 guidelines. Usually we do fetal echocardiography if the risk for the baby to have congenital heart disease is more than 3% as we know that the normal percentage is 1%. But in reality we are limited by the insurance, financial capacity of the health system and the availability of the personnel. Uh, Indications are divided into groups. The first thing is the fetal indication, then they have the maternal and the environmental exposure, and then we have non-solid indications. But we must remember that any baby is a candidate for congenital heart disease because many of the patients that we see with congenital heart disease, actually they don't have any risk factors. So we should be always focusing while doing the antenatal scan for baby, even there is no risk factor to look for the basic views to not to miss anything. Uh, so what are the fetal indications? We have two groups. First one is the class one indications where the fetal echocardiogram should be done. This is when you have suspected cardiac structure anomaly in the, norm, in the regular antenatal scan. If you are worried about the cardiac functions, especially if there is hydrops fetalis, if there is problem with the heart rhythm, if there is severe tachycardia more than 180 or bradycardia more than 120, which is persistent. Or if we have anything major fetal extracardiac anomaly, we should go and check to the heart and on the other way also. If there is knuckle translucent thickness of 3.5 millimeter or more, or if you have confirmed chromosomal anomalies by invasive techniques, or if there is monochorionic twins. Class two indications that the patient might or it's sensible to refer them if there is systemic venous anomalies or if the knuckle thickness is between three and 3.4. I will speak about a few minutes about the extracardiac anomalies. We must remember that the incidence of congenital heart disease in the presence of one or more extracardiac anomaly is 20 to 45 percent, depending on the population and on the malformation type. If we look here, cardiac malformation has been observed in up to. Uh, cardiac malformation have been present in up to 70% of cases of genitourinary abnormalities and 30% of omphalocele, 30% of congenital diaphragmatic hernia and in 20% of duodenal atresia and 5 to 15 of cases with uh, CNS malformation will also have extracardiac anomalies. Again, if we go to the extra chromosomal anomalies, we must remember that some cardiac defects are highly linked to have some underlying chromosomal anomalies, especially the atrioventricular septal defect and tetralogy of fallow and truncus arteriosus. Uh, regarding the knuckle translucency, we can see like a very important association between the thickness and the privilege, priv uh, pr prevalence of the disease. Like if we have, as long as we, the thickness increase, there is marked increase in the incidence of having the problem. Monochorionic twins are associated with nine-fold higher risk of congenital heart disease. Actually, we don't know why, but there is one hypothesis that the placental vascular anastomosis between the monozygotic twins circulation might lead to fluctuation in the blood flow during early fetal development, causing congenital heart disease, but this is not confirmed. Okay, if we go now to the maternal indications, we will also have two groups, class one indications which must we refer the baby. The most important one of top is pregestational diabetes mellitus regardless of the hemoglobin A1C level. So even with good control, we should refer. And if there is gestational diabetes diagnosed in the first or early second trimester, we should also refer the baby. Uh, and in all assisted pregnancy, in, uh, including XZ cases, and in phenylcotinuria, especially if there is poor control or if the level is above 10, milli, uh, 10 millimole, and on, autos, uh, on all auto, autoimmune disease, especially if they have positive, uh, positive antijogrin syndrome antibodies, if there is a prior affected sapling, and if there is first degree relative of the baby who has congenital heart disease, we should refer the baby. 
and if there is first or second degree relative with Mendelian inheritance disease and there is a history of childhood cardiac affection, uh, we should refer. And last, uh, last two, if they, we have retinoid exposure or first trimester rubella infection. Class two, the baby is reasonable to be referred when there is selected teragenic, uh, mostly drugs like lithium, carbamazepine, ACE inhibitors for many people who are having uh, um, high blood pressure. Usually, we, this is why we advise against the use of ACE in childbearing age. Uh, in, autosomal, in, in autoimmune disease, if there is positive antibody, but there is no prior affected sibling. And in second degree relative of the baby with congenital heart disease. Let's speak about the diabetes. Uh, in, this, in this registrar, for, uh, in, it was done in America. It showed, it was speaking about the, uh, the prevalence and the, 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 they were looking for the causes and for the association there. It was related, the hypothesis that it's related to the apoptosis, to the abnormal nitric oxide signaling, and to the, and to the high level of insulin by itself, uh, because it's a high level of glu glu glucose itself, because it's maybe teratogenic to the baby. It, uh, there is fourfold increase in the offspring of patients with diabetes mellitus to have, uh, to have congenital heart disease. And if there is a single maternal episode of acute diabetic complication, the risk is higher, so suggesting there is a role for glucose in the actual pathogenesis. Regarding phenylketonuria, we have this study. This study included parents, who, uh, mothers who were con treated but poor controlled from the States, from Germany, from Canada, and from Denmark. Uh, in this study, they linked the, the, uh, the incidence of congenital heart disease with the level of the phenyl, uh, phenyl alanine. So as we see here in the table, as the level of the phenyl alanine, uh, phenyl alanine increase, the incidence highly increase. Uh, they found that there is 14% uh, of their patient have congenital heart disease, and the international ratio is from 12 to 15. Okay. We see non-solid indication, and usually we receive many patients in the clinic to refer for these causes as uh, many, many of them as single, uh, single isolated umbilical artery, focus, uh, echogenic focus, uh, maternal fever or viral infection, isolated congenital heart disease in a second degree relatives. Okay, now if we diagnose the baby with congenital heart disease, what is our next step to do? First, as we said, that there is high association between congenital heart disease and other types of congenital anomaly, we should start to screen for other problems. So when we find congenital heart disease, we will go to look outside the heart again to sure that we are missing anything. Then we will refer to the specialist. As we know, we, congenital heart disease, uh, we will have to, to, to refer to a fetal medicine. We will have to refer to, uh, to pediatric cardiology. We will see, we'll have to refer for genetic assessment because genetic assessments are highly associated. We have this huge table that we are, I believe we are all struggling to memorize. <laughs> And then if there is any chance for fetal therapy, as we said, like in patient with arrhythmia or patient who need invasive interventions, if there is a chance in the place we are working for, then we will plan for the follow-up. Follow-up will depend on the nature of the disease, of, uh, if we are expecting any progress, like if there is a problem in the cardiac uh, functions, if we are any expecting anything to worsen, if we are expecting any valve to get more narrow. So all this will determine how much we would see the patient. Then we will start to plan for the delivery, and this is very important. Delivery should be planned in a facility with appropriate level of care for the mother and unit. We will come to this also later. Units with ductal dependent lesion and most other critical cardiac lesions should be delivered in a facility with level three neonatal ICU and pediatric cardiology expertise. If this is not available, transport should be ready. There has no been no evidence to suggest that C-section would protect the baby and no evidence to support that early planning for delivery would benefit the baby. Uh, the American Heart Association has put a guidelines on the delivery room recommendations. So what, what we, if we need a special uh, preparation in the delivery room, we have this four, categ uh, four categories where it must be done special recommendations like in DTGA or uncontrolled tachycardia, or it's reasonable for the patient with hyperplastic heart disease with restrictive or intact interatrial symptoms, or it might be considered in tetralogy and epistine and uh, total anomalous, and is not needed in like simple shunt lesion, simple fallow, 
in most uh, in ductal dependent lesion, we must we may not need a special delivery room, but we need to initiate the prostaglandin early in the NICU, and then if we have controlled arrhythmia, it's fine that we don't need uh, any preparation. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will just ask you, I will need your, uh, your opinion. What do you think if these guidelines are sufficient? If you think that we can, if we depend on them, do we have to, uh, to, uh, to, we will be able to catch all the babies or if you suggest anything. Let's think about this question, okay? Thank you.